Well, as you might have guessed, based on our scripture, today's message is about the wedding. We have an opening slide here, I think. There it is. So this is a depiction of the wedding at Cana. And uh, only a depiction. I mean, there were no pictures there. We really don't know what it looked like. Uh, this was done by an artist, uh, Franz Franken, in 1581. And I just want you to know how open-minded I am. Uh, Franken is actually not one of the Dutch uh, master artists, but he is from Antwerp in uh, Belgium. And of course, this is very close to the Netherlands, so we'll put up his artwork anyway. All right, you can... Today we're going to talk about weddings. And after all, who doesn't like a good wedding? A wedding is a special event. It signifies the love of two people as they move ahead in their lives. And it is an occasion full of love. Often unmarried couples who attend a wedding are thinking, maybe they'll be the next couple to join in love as they nudge their partner thinking maybe there's going to be a proposal coming. And other couples who've been married for a few years may reminisce about their wedding and recall their vows. There may even be a few tears shed during the wedding. Love is definitely in the air, and we want to be a part of that experience. Weddings are a special occasion. For a few minutes, we're going to imagine that you are attending a wedding. The wedding you're attending is being conducted by a minister you haven't seen before. So you're a bit curious to see how they will perform the wedding service. The soon to be married couple are from your church and they ask everyone from the congregation to attend. You're thinking, this is great. I get to see all my friends and have a great meal at the same time. The wedding ceremony itself goes well. The young couple have a select, uh, they've selected a commonly used scripture reading as a part of their ceremony. It's from 1 Corinthians 13. I'm sure many of you, probably most of you will recognize it. And it begins, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Did any of you use that at your wedding? Yep, I heard a couple of yips there. Everything at the wedding is going great. It happens the minister brought his mother to the wedding. She mentioned something to him about the wedding, and he says, Woman, what does this have to do with me? When you overhear this, you're a bit surprised. He addresses his mother as woman. She is a woman, but it's not how you would address your mother. I know if I addressed my mother by saying woman, I know I would be having a long conversation with my father. <laughs> and I would not be addressing him as man. In any event, the minister's mother is pointing out that they're running out of wine at the bar. So he asks the bartender to bring some containers of water over and proceeds to turn the water into wine. Whether you drink wine or not, you're impressed. You've never seen anything like this in your life. But you're left with mixed feelings. On the one hand, you're saying, this minister is amazing. On the other hand, you're thinking, just how much wine does this minister plan to drink? I don't know what that was. I've been to a few weddings over the years, including my own. Maybe you should let me know whether Brenda's on Zoom today. Before. And I can tell you, I'm a bit concerned. Not because of the wine. When Brenda and I were married, the cost of the hall, the meal, the bar, the disc jockey was about $2,500. And that was for about 130 people. And just for the record, 
Most of them were from Brenda's family, of course. <laughs> Nowadays, you'd be lucky to pay less than $100 a plate for just the hall, the meal, and the bar. So that would be about $13,000. And don't forget the wedding dress, the tuxedo rentals, the flowers, the photographer, the limo, and on and on and on. For a wedding of 130 people, I don't think it would be a stretch to say the bill would be in excess of $20,000. If any of you attended a recent wedding of that size, let me know if you think I'm off the mark. When you think about a young couple starting out, I would think this would be a huge expense. Not to mention after they get married, they might want a house. Well, guess what? Would you be prepared to pay three or $400,000 for a house when you got married? And that's in the Chatham Kent Wallaceburg area. What about Toronto? Finances or a lack thereof might be a significant issue for a young couple starting out, so much so that it may affect whether they have a family or how many children they have. Weddings these days are becoming big business, and a young couple will want the same kind of wedding their friends have. Oh, and don't forget the honeymoon, which almost certainly has to be a faraway island at a southerly location at an all-inclusive resort. And by southerly island, I'm not talking about Peely Island. It brings to mind my own honeymoon trip, which was a road trip to Nova Scotia. We had a wonderful time. All went well, except for the confetti, which kept which some of our friends had poured into the air ducts in our car. Can you imagine confetti blowing out of you for days and days to come after your trip began? I'm sure it was all in good fun. Do people still do that at weddings? I think they should. <laughs> Any of you know of somebody having a wedding coming up? I would be happy to come over and bring some bags of confetti and put it in their car. Just a few weeks ago, I heard an interesting statistic about marriages on the radio. Very concerning. Would it surprise you to learn that in 2020 in Canada alone, there were 2.71 million divorces? I was shocked. I, I double checked. When I first heard the statistic, I couldn't believe it. I wondered how many couples part a company over money related issues. Some of you might remember several years ago, one of our ministers from Trinity made an offer to young couples who were thinking about getting married. He said he would conduct the service as a part of the Sunday worship service. So no hall rental, no extra charge for the minister, and no extra charge for a soloist or an organ player. I mean, although the soloist should certainly be paid, no matter. And you would have as many witnesses as you would need. The whole congregation would be there. In fact, the couple would probably have the reception at the church, and we had a UCW at the time probably would have prepared some sandwiches and squares. And he was making the offer solely because he was aware of the financial burden that a wedding would have on a young couple. And since then, and I'm guessing that was about 25 years ago, can you guess how many couples have taken advantage of it? Well, I'm not aware of any. But... Cana, Cana is an ancient village. And when they use the phrase ancient village, it means if you go to the Holy Land today and look for Cana, it's a, it's a city that used to exist at the time of Christ. So it's not there now. It would have been located near the Sea of Galilee. And it would seem likely that a wedding at that time would have included most, if not all, of the people from the village. It's not likely a young couple would have to worry about hiring a caterer or finding a hall for the wedding. I would think between the families involved and others in the village, food would have been prepared and brought to the wedding, something like a potluck dinner. And who doesn't like a potluck dinner? The local rabbi would have presided over the wedding and it's likely the father of the bride would have been responsible for the wine. From our scripture reading in John 2, we also learn that Jesus, along with his disciples, were invited to the wedding. Jesus was not well known at that time. 
So perhaps the local rabbi suggested his invitation. And he also brought his mother, Mary. As you may have guessed by now, I have a couple of issues with the scripture about the wedding in Cana. When I first read Jesus referring to his mother as woman, I thought, well, Jesus, maybe somebody should teach you some manners. Of course, there are a lot of words used in scripture, which if we simply took a literal interpretation, we would find many such issues. I remind myself that the Bible is a very complex book. It was written over a period of many centuries. Very briefly, we know the Old Testament was written well before the years of Christ, and it provides an excellent history chronology, as well as an excellent description of faith practices and rules of the day, of that day. The New Testament is more current, but still dates back almost 2,000 years ago. So my reminder when we read scripture is that many of the words and references in the Bible refer to what was common at that time each section was written. So I'm thinking this was a common reference to a woman, whether she was your mother or not, at that time. My other issue has to do with the conversion of water to wine. It says Jesus approved of wine at the wedding so much so that he generated more wine. My issue here is the number of people who I have heard over the years use this scripture as a rationale for drinking wine or any other type of alcohol, which I personally enjoy a glass of wine, but I take exception to people who justify drinking perhaps excessively by saying, well, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Or they might say, well, if Jesus could drink, so can I. I'm, not, I'm trying not to make a judgment about drinking, but I tell you, a lot of people have referred to this scripture, and at least I have a bit of an issue with it. There is another reason for the wedding in Cana, and another reason for Jesus being in attendance. Jesus was a relative unknown at the time of the wedding, so this marks one of his first public appearances. And even the disciples were not completely aware of what Jesus was capable of and what his true reason for being was. Of course, his mother knew. And she said to him, they have no wine, to which he replied, my hours has not yet come. And Mary turned to the servants and said, do whatever he tells you. She knew the time had come, and she knew the people at the wedding were in need. So shouldn't a good son always listen to his mother? The answer to that is yes, by the way. Jesus knew of a love that people had not experienced before. He knew firsthand about the wonders of God, the wonders of creation, and the differences this love could have in the lives of everyone. Jesus was in the perfect setting to begin his mission to advocate for love in the world. He also knew his beliefs would be met with some resistance from the established religion, religious beliefs of the day. Some of the rabbis who had heard Jesus speak were initially impressed with what he was saying and his level of commitment, but others were troubled by his claim to have a direct relationship with God, more or less thinking for a young man he speaks almost too boldly about what we hold sacred. So Jesus knew he needed to put words into action. And what better way than to show firsthand what the wonders of God look like? And what better place to start than at a wedding, a place full of love, a place where celebration was already the theme of the day. If we go back a few more hundred years, we look at our scripture reading from Isaiah almost 600 years before the birth of Christ. And it is referring to the time when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. God is recommitting to the city and the citizens of Jerusalem and makes an analogy to taking your wedding vows a second time. He refers to Jerusalem as, my delight is in her and your land is now married. The same as a young couple getting married for the first time. He is saying, just as a bridegroom rejoices over a bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. 
So just as a couple commit to each other's love, so too will God commit his love for you. Further, we can say that just as you love God, so will God love you. So no matter where there have been setbacks in your life, no matter whether you have had some difficult times, God's love is there for you, just as the love of a newlywed couple have for each other. This is the depth of love that Christ was aware of when he attended the wedding at Cana. This is the type of commitment and dedication that Christ was aware of for the citizens of Jerusalem. And this is the love that Christ wanted to share with each of the wedding guests. And he wanted their attention. He wanted them to be amazed. And who wouldn't be amazed by witnessing one of Christ's miracles? Weddings are still a big deal. Many weddings are still conducted by a minister. And during most weddings, a couple of carefully selected vows as an indication of the commitment they have for each other. The love a couple have for each other can sustain many storms, just like God's love can help us through life's ups and downs. It's a love that feels far away at times, a love that may seem absent at times. But like Jerusalem, God will recommit every time, and Jesus will commit every time. Their love will always be there for us. We only need to say, I do. Amen.